Section three of Drake by Alfred Noyes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Book two, part one. So on a misty grey December morn, five ships put out from calm old Plymouth Sound, five little ships, the largest not so large as many a coasting yacht or fishing trawl to-day yet these must brave uncharted seas of unimagined terrors haunted glooms and shadowy horrors of an unknown world wild as primeval chaos in the first the golden hind a ship of eighteen guns drake sailed john winter a queen's captain next brought out the elizabeth a stout new ship of sixteen guns the pinnace christopher came next in staunch command of old tom moon who five years back with reeking powder grimed off cartagena fought against the stars all night and as the sun arose in blood knee-deep in blood and brine stood in the dark perilous hold and scuttled his own ship the swan bidding her down to god's great deep rather than yield her up a prize to spain lastly two gentlemen adventurers brought out the new swan and the marigold their crews all told were eight score men and boys not only terrors of the deep they braved bodiless witchcrafts of the black abyss red gaping mouths of hell and gulfs of fire that yawned for all who passed the tropic line but death lurked round them from their setting forth mendoza plenipotentiary of spain by spies informed had swiftly warned his king who sent out mandates through his huge empire from Gaudacilbert to the golden west for the instant sinking of all english ships and the instant execution of their crews who durst appear in the caribbean sea moreover in the pith of their emprise a peril lurked burley's emissaries the smooth-tongued thomas doughty who had brought his brother unacquitted of that charge of poisoning raised against him by the friends of essex but in luckless time released lately for lack of proof on no strong plea these two wound through them like two snakes at ease in eden waiting for their venomous hour especially did thomas doughty toil with soft and flowery tongue to win his way and drake whose rich imagination craved for something more than simple seaman's talk was marvellously drawn to this new friend who with the scholar's mind the courtier's gloss the lawyer's wit the adventurer's romance gold honey from the blooms of ephoes rare flashes from the mermaid and sweet smiles copied from sydney's self even to the glance of sudden liquid sympathy gave drake that banquet of the soul he ne'er had known nor needed till he knew but needed now so to the light of doughty's answering eyes he poured his inmost thoughts out hour by hour and doughty coiled up in the heart of drake against such odds the tiny fleet set sail yet gallantly and with heroic pride escutcheoned pavisades emblazoned poops banners and painted shields and clothes fights hung with scarlet broideries every polished gun grinned through the jaws of some heraldic beast gilded and carven and gleaming with all hues while in the cabin of the golden hind rich perfumes floated given by the great queen herself to drake as captain-general 
so that it seemed her soul was with the fleet a presence to remind him far away of how he talked with england face to face no pirate he but gloriana's knight silver and gold his table furniture engraved and richly chased lavishly gleamed while fanned by favouring airs the ships advanced with streaming flags and ensigns and sweet chords of music struck by skilled musicians whom drake brought with him not from vanity but knowing how the pulse of men beats high to music and the hearts of men like these were open to the high romance of earth and they that dwelt so near god's mystery were proud of their own manhood they went out to danger as to a sweetheart far away light as the sea-birds dipping their white wings in foam before the gently heaving prows each heart beat while the low soft lapping splash of water racing past them ripped and tore whiter and faster and the bellying sails filled out and the chalk cliffs of england sank dwindling behind the broad grey plains of sea meekly content and tamely stay at home the sea-birds seemed that piped across the waves and drake bemused leaned smiling to his friend doughty and said is it not strange to know when we return yon speckled herring gulls will still be wheeling dipping flashing there we shall not find a fairer land afar than those time-scented hills we leave behind soon the young lambs will bleat across the coombs and breezes will bring puffs of hawthorn scent down devon lanes over the purple moors lavrocks will carol and on the village greens around the maypole while the moon hangs low the boys and girls of england merrily swing in country footing through the morris dance but many of us indeed shall not return then the other with a laugh nay like the man who slept a hundred years we shall return and find our england strange there are great storms brewing god only knows what we shall find perchance a spanish king upon the throne what then and drake i should put down my helm and out once more to the unknown golden west to die as i have lived in a free land so said he while the white cliffs dwindled down faded and vanished but the prosperous wind carried the five ships onward over the swell of swinging sweeping seas till the sun sank and height o'er height the chaos of the skies broke out into the miracle of the stars frostily glittering all the milky way lay bare like diamond dust upon the robe of some great king orion and the plough glimmered through drifting gulfs of silver fleece and far away in italy that night young galileo looking upward heard the self same whisper through that wild abyss which now called drake out to the unknown west but after supper drake came up on deck with doughty and on the cold poop as they leaned and gazed across the rolling gleam and gloom of mighty muffled seas began to give voices to those lovely captives of the brain which like princesses in some forest tower still yearn for the delivering prince the sweet far bugle note that calls from answering minds he told him how in those dark days which now seemed like an evil dream when the princess elizabeth even trembled for her life and read there by the gleam of smithfield fires 
those cunning lessons of diplomacy which saved her then and now for england's sake he passed his youth twas when the power of spain began to light the gloom with that great glare of martyrdom which while the stars endure bears witness how men overcame the world trod the red flames beneath their feet like flowers and cast aside the blackening robe of flesh while with a crown of joy upon their heads even as into a palace they passed through the portals of the tomb to prove their love stronger at least than death and in those days a puritan with iron in his soul having in earlier manhood occupied his business in great waters and beheld the bloody cowls of the inquisition pass before the midnight moon as he kept watch and having then forsworn the steely sea to dwell at home in england with his love at tavistock in devon edmund drake began albeit to near the abbey walls to speak too staunchly for his ancient faith and with his young child francis had to flee by night at last for shelter to the coast little the boy remembered of that flight pillioned behind his father save the clang and clatter of the hoofs on stony ground striking a sharp blue fire while country tales of highwaymen kindled his reckless heart as the great steed went shouldering through the night there francis laying a little sunburnt hand on the big bolstered pistol at each side dreamed with his wide grey eyes that he himself was riding out on some freebooting quest and felt himself heroic league by league the magic world rolled past him as they rode leaving him nothing but a memory of his own making vaguely he perceived a thousand meadows darkly streaming by with clouds of perfume from their secret flowers a wayside cottage window pointing out a golden finger o'er the purple road a puff of garden roses or a waft of honeysuckle blown along a wood while overhead that silver ship the moon sailed slowly down the gulfs of glittering stars till at the last a buffet of fresh wind fierce with sharp savours of the stinging brine against his dreaming face brought up a roar of mystic welcome from the channel seas and there drake paused for a moment as a song stole o'er the waters from the marigold where some musician striking luscious chords of sweet stringed music freed his heart's desire in symbols of the moment which the rest and doughty among them scarce could understand the moon is up the stars are bright the wind is fresh and free we're out to seek for gold to-night across the silver sea the world was growing grey and old break out the sails again we're out to seek a realm of gold beyond the spanish main we're sick of all the cringing knees the courtly smiles and lies god let thy singing channel breeze lighten our hearts and eyes let love no more be bought and sold for earthly loss or gain we're out to seek an age of gold beyond the spanish main beyond the light of far cathay beyond all mortal dreams beyond the reach of night and day our eldorado gleams revealing as the skies unfold a star without a stain the glory of the gates of gold beyond the spanish main and as the skilled musician made the words of momentary meaning still simply his own eternal hope and heart's desire without belief perchance 
in drake's own quest to drake's own greater mind the eternal glory seemed to transfigure his immediate hope but doughty only heard a sweet concourse of sounds they ceased and drake resumed his tale of that strange flight in boyhood to the sea next the red curtained inn and kindly hands of protestant plymouth held his memory long often in strange and distant dreams he saw that scene which now he tenderly portrayed to doughty's half ironic smiling lips half sympathetic eyes he saw again that small inn parlour with the homely fare set forth upon the table saw the gang of seamen dripping from the spray come in like great new thoughts to some adventurous brain feeding his wide grey eyes he saw them stand around the crimson fire and stamp their feet and scatter the salt drops from their big sea boots and all that night he lay awake and heard mysterious thunderings of eternal tides moaning out of a cold and houseless gloom beyond the world that made it seem most sweet to slumber in a little four-walled inn immune from all that vastness but at dawn he woke he leapt from bed he ran and looked there through the tiny high bright casement there o oh, fairy vision of that small boy's face peeping at daybreak through the diamond pane there first he saw the wondrous new-born world and round its princely shoulders wildly flowing gemmed with a myriad clusters of the sun the magic azure mantle of the sea and afterwards there came those marvellous days when on that battleship a disused hulk rotting to death in chatham reach they found sanctuary and a dwelling-place at last for hawkins that great shipman being their friend a protestant with power on plymouth town nigh half whereof he owned made edmund drake reader of prayer to all the ships of war that lay therein so there the dreaming boy francis grew up in that grim nursery among the ropes and masts and great dumb mouths of idle ordnance in that hulk he heard many a time his father and his friends over some wild-eyed troop of refugees thunder against the powers of spain and rome idolaters who defiled the house of god in england and all round them as he heard the clang and clatter of shipwright hammers rang and hour by hour upon his vision rose in solid oak reality new ships as ilion rose to music ships of war the visible shapes and symbols of his dream unconscious yet but growing as they grew a wondrous incarnation hour by hour till with their towering masts they stood complete embodied thoughts in god's own dockyards built for drake ere long to lead against the world there as to round the tail with ringing gold across the waters from the full-plumed swan the music of a mermaid roundelay our lady of the sea a dorian theme tuned to the soul of england charmed the moon queen venus wandered away with a cry n'oserez-vous mon bel ami for the purple wound in adon's thigh je vous en prie pity me with a bitter farewell from sky to sky and a moan a moan from sea to sea n'oserez-vous mon bel mon bel n'oserez-vous mon bel ami the soft aegean heard her sigh no serez-vous mon bel ami heard the spartan hills reply je vous en prie pity me 
Spain was aware of her drawing nigh, foot gilt from the blossoms of Italy. No serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami. In France they heard her voice go by, no serez-vous, mon bel ami, and on the May wind droop and die, je vous en prie, pity me. Your maidens choose their loves, but I, white as I came from the foam-white sea, no serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami. The warm red meal-winged butterfly, no serez-vous, mon bel ami, beat on her breast in the golden rye, je vous en prie, pity me. Stained her breast with a dusty dye, red as the print of a kiss might be, no serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami. Is there no land afar or nigh, no serez-vous, mon bel ami, but dreads the kiss of the sea, ah, why, je vous en prie, pity me. Why will ye cling to the loves that die, is earth all add-on to my plea? No serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami. Under the warm blue summer sky, no serez-vous, mon bel ami, with outstretched arms and a low, long sigh, je vous en prie, pity me. Over the channel they saw her fly to the white-cliffed island that crowns the sea, no serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami. England laughed as her queen drew nigh, no serez-vous, mon bel ami to the white-walled cottages gleaming high, je vous en prie, pity me. They drew her in with a joyful cry to the hearth where she sits with a babe on her knee. She has turned her moan to a lullaby. She is nursing a son to the kings of the sea. No serez-vous, mon bel, mon bel, no serez-vous, mon bel ami such memories on the plunging golden hind under the stars drake drew before his friend clomb for a moment to that peak of vision that purple peak of darien laughing aloud o'er those wild exploits down to rio grande which even now had made his fierce renown terrible to all lonely ships of spain e'en now indeed that poet of Portugal, Lope de Vega, filled with this new fear, began to meditate his epic muse, till, like a cry of panic from his lips, he shrilled the faint Dragontea forth, wherein Drake is that dragon of the apocalypse, the dread antagonist of God and man. Well had it been for Doughty on that night, had he not heard what followed, for indeed, when two minds clash, not often does the less conquer the greater, but without one thought of evil, seeing they now were safe at sea, Drake told him, only somewhat, yet too much, of that close conference with the queen, and, lo, the face of Doughty blanched with a slow thought, that crept like a cold worm through all his brain thus much i knew though secretly before but here he freely tells me as his friend if i be false and he be what they say his knowledge of my knowledge will mean death but drake looked round at doughty with a smile and said forgive me now thou art not used to these cold nights at sea thou tremblest friend let us go down and drink a cup of sack to our return and at that kindly smile doughty shook off his nightmare mood and thought the yard-arm is for dogs not gentlemen even drake would not misuse a man of birth and in the cabin of the golden hind revolving subtle treacheries he sat 
there with the sugared phrases of the court bartering beads for gold he drew out all the simple devon seaman's inmost heart and coiled up in the soul of francis drake there in the solemn night they interchanged lies for sweet confidences from one wall the picture of drake's love looked down on him and like a bashful schoolboy's that bronzed face flushed as he blurted out with brightening eyes and quickening breath how he had seen her first crowned on the village green a queen of may her name too was elizabeth he said as if it proved that she too was a queen though crowned with milk-white devon may alone and queen but of one plot of meadow-sweet as yet he said he had only kissed her hand smiled in her eyes and there drake also flinched thinking i ne'er may see her face again and doughty comforted his own dark heart thinking i need not fear so soft a soul as this and yet he wondered how the man seeing his love so gripped him none the less could leave her thus to follow after dreams for faith to doughty was an unknown word and trustfulness the property of fools at length they parted each to his own couch doughty with half a chuckle francis drake with one old-fashioned richly grateful prayer blessing all those he loved as he had learnt beside his mother's knee in devon days so all night long they sailed but when a rift of orchard crimson broke the yellowing gloom and barred the closely clouded east with dawn behold a giant galleon overhead lifting its huge black shining sides on high loomed like some misty monster of the deep and suddenly rolling out great gorgeous folds over her rumbled like a thunder-cloud the heavy flag of spain the splendid poop mistily lustrous as a dragon's hoard seen in some magic cave-mouth o'er the sea through shimmering april sunlight after rain blazed to the morning and her portholes grinned with row on row of cannon there at once one sharp shrill whistle sounded and those five small ships mere minnows clinging to the flanks of that leviathan unseen unheard undreamt of grappled her she seemed asleep swinging at ease with great half-slackened sails majestically careless of the dawn there in the very native seas of spain there with the yeast and foam of her proud cliffs her own blue coasts in sight across the waves up her titanic sides without a sound the naked-footed british seamen swarmed with knives between their teeth then on her decks they dropped like panthers and the softly fierce black-bearded watch of spaniards all amazed rubbing their eyes as if at a wild dream upraised a sudden shout el drake el drake and flashed their weapons out but all too late for ere their sleeping comrades reached the deck the little watch outnumbered and outmatched lay bound and o'er the hatches everywhere the points of naked cutlasses on guard gleamed and without a struggle those below gave up their arms their poignards jewelled thick with rubies and their blades of spanish steel then onward o'er the great grey gleaming sea they swept with their rich booty night and day five other prizes one for every ship out of the seas of spain they suddenly caught and carried with them laughing as they went 
now now indeed the rubicon is crossed now have we singed the eyelids and the beard of spain now have we roused the hornet's nest now shall we sail against a world in arms now have we not between us and black death but our own hands five ships and threescore guns so laughed they plunging through the bay of storms biscay and past gibraltar not yet clothed with british thunder though as one might dream gazing in dim prophetic grandeur out across the waves while that small fleet went by or watching them with love's most wistful fear as they plunged southward to the lonely coasts of africa till right in front up soared tremendous over ocean tenerife cloud robed but crowned with colours of the dawn already those two traitors were at work doughty and his false brother among the crews who knew not yet the vastness of their quest nor dreamed of aught beyond the accustomed world for drake had kept it secret and the thoughts of some that he had shipped before the mast set sail scarce farther than for mogador in west morocco or at the utmost mark for northern egypt by the midnight woods and crystal palace roofed with chrysoprase where prester john had reigned five hundred years and sidon river of jewels through the dark enchanted gorges rolled its rays along some thought of rio grande but scarce to ten the true intent was known while to divert the rest from care the skilled musicians played but those two doughties cunningly devised by chance dropped words to breathe a hint abroad and through the forecastles crept a grisly fear of things that lay beyond the bourne of earth till even those hardy seamen almost quailed and now at any whisper they might turn with terror in their eyes they might refuse to sail into that fabled burning void or brave that primum mobile which drew or daring ships into the jaws of hell beyond the pole antarctic where the sea rushed down through fiery mountains and no sail could e'er return against its roaring stream end of book two part one